Good day and welcome to Kojiko Inc. and Kojiko Communications Inc. Q3 2023 Earnings Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Patrice Wimay, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Kojiko Inc. and Kojiko Communications Inc. Please go ahead, Mr. Wimay. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this third quarter conference call, which Philip and I will uh, present. So before we begin this call, as usual, I'd like to remind listeners that the call is subject to forward-looking statements, which can be found in the press releases issued yesterday. And uh, I'll turn the call over to Philip Jeté. Thank you, Patrice, and good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Our third quarter consolidated results were in line with our expectations. We demonstrated once again our focus on balancing subscriber growth with financial performance while remaining disciplined on our cost structure. While BreezeLine continued to face headwinds from the macroeconomic and nationwide competitive environments, Kojiko Connection performed well in the quarter, marked by continued organic growth in its internet customer base and further supplemented by our Oxio acquisition in March. In both Canada and the United States, we generated higher revenue per customer, driven by a better product mix and supported by our fiber-powered wireline networks. We continued to execute successfully on our fiber-to-the-home network expansion programs which continue to drive new internet subscribers in both markets. Overall, we've added 101,000 homes passed since the beginning of this fiscal year. If we include those added in fiscal 22, this brings us to more than 171,000 additional homes passed, representing a 6% growth of our network. These expansions are made in attractive areas from demographic or competitive standpoints and where we are targeting very healthy penetration rates. Like the government subsidized fiber expansions that we are undertaking in Canada, we are pursuing regional programs in the United States, such as the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative, where we recently were awarded 15 million in funding to expand to 7,500 unserved homes and businesses. We also look forward to the launch of the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Funding Program in the United States. Called BEAD, each state will run its own process of allocating funds by region. Within our traditional markets, our reliable high-speed network, innovative digital product offering, and local customer service all position us well for future organic growth. In terms of mobile development in Canada, the CRTC released the final terms and conditions of the MVNO regulatory framework in May. And while the final decision did not introduce any material changes to the regime, we were pleased to see the CRTC establish a deadline for rate negotiations by August 7th and stated that it would consider using all the tools at its disposal should this time frame not be met. We have initiated MVNO access negotiations But as you will understand, for competitive reasons, we cannot provide further details on these negotiations. And securing satisfactory wholesale rates for access to incumbent wireless networks will be critical to the viability and long-term success of our mobile entry. During the quarter, we also purchased spectrum licenses in the 25 and 3500 megahertz bands in Quebec. With this acquisition, we have a spectrum that now covers 95% of our Canadian footprint. 
With regards to wholesale high-speed access services, the CRTC recently launched a review of its existing regulatory framework, and in our submissions to the CRTC, we are urging the regulator to ensure that any new wholesale access mandate resulting from this review does not undermine investment and innovation, and that regulated wholesale rates reflect the true cost of building networks. To that end, we have proposed that access to the wholesale regime be limited to small carriers, and that nascent fiber to the home deployments be exempt from the mandate. Finally, on ESG, Kojiko was named on the, for the sixth consecutive year, one of the best 50 corporate citizens in Canada by Corporate Night. This highly respected ranking recognized Canadian companies that are setting the standards for leadership in sustainable growth. I will now review our operational results. Let's start with our Canadian operations. As mentioned earlier, we continue to connect more homes in unserved and underserved communities in both provinces, where we added 15,000 homes passed during the quarter, and a total of more than 88,000 homes passed, including those added in fiscal 22. These fiber to the home expansion projects are mostly in partnership with government and are already paying off with customer loadings. Our Canadian team continued on its path to excellence by executing effective sales and marketing strategies and by providing a distinctive customer experience, which led our internet customer base to grow this quarter by 11,100 across our traditional markets, newly served areas, and in regions where Oxio is present. The Canadian business has also improved its ARPU with an improved customer product mix. Now moving on to the U.S. operations. During the quarter, we continued our fiber network expansion with 15,500 new homes pass this quarter, or 83,000 homes pass, including those added in fiscal 22, which add, resulted in new internet subscribers. But the market remained challenging due to the macroeconomic environment and competitive intensity. Within our traditional markets, we reported 2,600 internet customer losses, which were not expected and mainly driven by aggressive offers by competitors in response to uh, fixed wireless access competition they are facing in other areas. However, the product mix has improved with a greater proportion of new connections taking faster internet speeds and therefore driving a higher average revenue per unit. In Ohio, internet net losses stood at 4,000 which is a small improvement over previous quarters, but below our expectations. During the quarter, we continued to densify and interconnect the network to, Breeze's, to Breeze Line's core. There is still more work on our plate to return to growth in our internet customer base in Ohio, and it will take more time to gain greater brand awareness in that market. For Kojiko Media, we continue to face headwinds from an industry-wide challenging radio advertising market, while our stations, once again, remain at the top of the ratings. In the meantime, we continue to expand multi-platform audio content options with more digital ad tech solutions. Now, let me turn the call over to Patrice, who will provide more details on our financial performance for the quarter. So thank you for that. So in Canada, Kojiko Connections revenue was up by 3.2%, resulting mainly from a higher internet service customer base, 
higher revenue per customer and the Oxio acquisition. EBITDA was stable due to revenue growth, offsetting higher operating expenses to drive and support customer growth. In the U.S., BreezeLine's revenue was down 5.7% in constant currency, mainly driven by a lower customer base in Ohio over the past year and an overall decline in video and phone customers, partially offset by higher revenue per customer and a better product mix. EBITDA decreased by 3.6%, reflecting lower revenue, partly offset by a higher gross margin, reflecting more internet within the revenue mix, as well as the impact of cost reduction initiatives. Turning to our consolidated numbers, at the consolidated level, revenue was down by 1.3% in constant currency, which led to a decline in adjusted EBITDA of 1.8%, mainly due to BreezeLine's performance, which I just explained, and stable EBITDA at Kojiko Connection. Capital intensity, as reported, was 22.9% compared to 25% last year, mainly from reduced CapEx spending in Canada. Excluding network expansion projects, capital intensity was 18.6%. Our free cash flow remains stable, and excluding network expansion projects, free cash flow would have decreased by 5.4% in the quarter. A dividend of 77.6 cents per share was declared in the quarter. We anticipate dividends to represent a payout ratio of about 36% of free cash flow this year and 24% when we exclude network uh, expansion. At the end of the quarter, our net debt to EBITDA was 3.4 turns, which reflects a higher US dollar against the Canadian dollar. Now, at Kujiko Inc., revenue in constant currency declined by 1.4%, and EBITDA by 2.2% as a result of Kojiko Communications' performance. Radio operations revenue decreased by 3.2% as the advertising market remained soft. During the quarter, we recognized a pre-tax non-cash impairment charge of $88 million related to our radio operations following an industry-wide reduction in radio advertising demand and a higher cost of capital. A dividend of 73.1 cents per share was declared during the quarter at Kojiko Inc. Now, in terms of outlook, we are maintaining our fiscal 23 financial guidelines as issued in January for both corporations and no real change in our full year expectations from what we outlined in our last call. At Kojiko Connection, we expect low to mid single digit revenue growth for the full year and low single-digit EBITDA growth. In terms of Q4 outlook at Kojiko Connection, we expect mid-single-digit growth in revenue, driven by organic growth from our traditional markets, incremental benefit from our expansion into newly built areas, and a contribution from the recent Oxio acquisition. We expect a low single-digit decline in EBITDA due to margin contraction stemming from higher OPEX to drive customer growth, including with our Oxio brand, which is uh, in a high growth phase at the moment. And also note that in last year's uh, Q4 results and added that we had certain favorable year-end adjustments. Now at BreezeLine, for the full year, we expect in constant currency a low single-digit decline in revenue while EBITDA is expected to be slightly negative. In Q4, our ex uh, we expect low single-digit growth in revenue, driven by a rate increase implemented in June, as well as continued growth from the network expansion projects. As for EBITDA, we expect stronger growth from higher revenue, less direct costs, a better product mix, and less OPEX due to certain cost efficiencies. Below EBITDA, at the consolidated level, I'll note that Q4 should normally have a similar level of acquisition, integration, restructuring, and other costs, as we recorded in Q3. In terms of CapEx, our guidelines account for the anticipated increase in capital intensity in Q4, as the summer months are typically a busier time to build. It also reflects investments related to strategic growth initiatives, including preparing for an eventual launch of mobile services in Canada. 
Now, Philippe and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Should you have a question, please press the star followed by the one on your touchtone phone. You will hear a three-tone prompt acknowledging your request. If you are using a speakerphone, please lift the handset before pressing any keys. First question comes from Maher Yagi at Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Uh, merci de prendre ma question. Mes questions. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Uh, I wanted to ask you on your U.S. business. Um, last quarter, you highlighted your expectation that you uh, were expecting to see growth in broadband subscribers outside of Ohio, but uh, the results show that you lost uh, subscribers both in Ohio and outside Ohio. So can you maybe uh, highlight or discuss what changed versus your prior expectation when it comes to your uh, broadband business uh, outside of Ohio? What are the factors that brought those numbers into the negative territory? And I have a follow-up question on wireless after. Thank you. Sure. Good morning, uh, Mayor. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, we operate in different states, uh, and uh, the level of competition is higher than before, as you know, so it's uh, no different than the last uh, few quarters. Uh, so if you look at the last year, we've had quarters where we were negative in terms of, um, if I focus on the Internet subscribers, uh, and some uh, some quarters we were flat and some others where we were positive. So it's a, it's a fine balance. We do have different levels of competition in different areas, and we have to uh, manage a balance between ARPUs, uh, profitability, and also subscriber loadings. Um, so I would say there's nothing particular that happened during the quarter. It's also a small, these are small values compared to the overall base we have in the U.S., but uh, it, is, it is more than, than uh, competitive than it used to be, especially from the fixed wireless access uh, uh, providers at the moment. But uh, overall, I would say um, outside Ohio, we've been able over the past year to maintain our base. So how should we approach uh, the rest of the year going forward in terms of uh, your loading um, since fixed wireless is uh, likely to remain a competitor for you uh, for the foreseeable future? Should we be forecasting continued wire, uh, broadband losses outside of Ohio or sh this should be resolved somehow uh, soon? Well, um, as I said, the, this quarter was uh, negative outside Ohio, but the previous quarter was positive. And if you look, if you look before that, we've had ups and downs as well. Um, so these numbers uh, change by the week. So obviously, and uh, our goal is to uh, to be uh, at the minimum flat and, and and to grow market share. But they will vary by quarter. So it's difficult to answer at this point exactly where uh, Q4 will stand, um, but again, it's managing uh, ARPUs and um, uh, especially on the acquisition front of new customers and, um, and uh, the subscriber loadings. Okay, uh, I'll move on to wireless because you have uh, moved, uh, you know, uh, you have made some moves uh, in wireless over the last quarter. Like you said, you bought some, some spectrum, uh, on, on the 2,500 and 3,500. So can you maybe update us on uh, where your discussions for uh, wholesale roaming and MVNO uh, are at and when do you expect some resolution to allow you to uh, operationalize the whole uh, uh, investment so far? So my F, um, it's Philippe. Uh, we, as you saw and as you heard me say, we're still determined to launch um, a, ser a mobile service in Canada, and we are now um, in negotiations with the MNO. For competitive reasons, we won't go further on this call, uh, but it remains a critical element of our business case to enter for the long term this market, so we are expecting to to close these negotiations uh, in line with our um, aspiration, uh, 
uh, but we're in we're into it right now. So more to come in the next quarter. And do you believe that the spectrum that you bought is enough for you to support over time uh, building up yourself, your network, and uh, moving the transfer of uh, frequency usage uh, from the MNO to your own network uh, over time? Yeah, well, uh, it will be a combination uh, of the spectrum we can acquire. It will be also a combination of different partnerships of the MVNO framework. So for the next seven years, um, we don't need to have all the spectrum in every territory. Right now, we cover 95% of our operating footprint where we have uh, fiber, a fiber backbone to, uh, to evolve a wireless operation later in time. So we're starting with an MVNO operation and as, thing, as time progress, uh, we will accumulate the assets that we need and or the partnerships that we need uh, to continue expanding. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question will be from Drew McReynolds at RBC. Please go ahead. This uh, question um, from my hair, uh, assuming or whenever commercial negotiations uh, are completed, let's, let's be aspirational here, um, what, what would be the timing in terms of ending those negotiations uh, and an actual commercial launch? And then second question in the Canadian broadband business, uh, good to see the uptick in internet net additions. Um, when you attribute it to footprint expansion, Oxio and organic um, growth in existing territories. Can you give us a sense of kind of what the, the relative contribution of, of each would be? Thank you. Hello, Drew. Uh, it's Philip. Let me start. Uh, in terms of uh, dates, I've already um, indicated earlier that uh, part of the CRTC process, there's the August 7th date uh, that was set as a deadline for MVNOs and MNOs to, uh, to, to agreed in, in negotiations. Uh, failing that, there will be um, uh, an FOA process, an arbitration process. So let's first get to August 7. Uh, hopefully, we will have close. If not, we will work with the CRTC uh, what the arbitration process needs to be, and we'll take it from there. On the um, on the other one, uh, Drew. Uh, so we were uh, we were very happy actually with the PSUs in Canada, as you saw. Um, despite some challenges in the U.S., uh, the Canadian ones were uh, very strong, and actually the previous quarter was good as well. Um, not to necessarily slice and dice the the the, the number uh, into uh, into these three buckets, but I can say that uh, the three areas, uh, which are the legacy business, the network expansions, and the Oxio additions in quarter, uh, did contribute uh, meaningfully uh, during the quarter. And uh, just to be clear, also, these numbers obviously don't include uh, what we acquired in Oxio. It just includes the change in the quarter, so the additions during the quarter. Okay, yeah, got it. Um, uh, just a quick follow-up, uh, sorry, to be back to wireless. Um, just whenever the process is finalized and you're good to go uh, with agreements in place, whether negotiated or through final offer arbitration, um, are, are you are you good to go almost within kind of week or, or weeks, or does it still take a little bit of time to uh, after uh, getting everything in place agreement-wise to, to launch? We've, um, we've previously indicated that uh, we have set up a team. So from um, the team point of view, we're there. There is some work that uh, we could have done regardless of the negotiations. There are some systems and, and some technical work that will need to happen pending what we uh, are able to secure or negotiate uh, in, in those negotiations. So there will be some work after the negotiation to set up the interconnections of systems, for example. Um, but we'll have to finalize the negotiation to see 
what exactly the, the, this work is and how long it's going to be. So unfortunately, we can't be more precise than that today. No, nope, that's, uh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Next question will be from Vince Valentini at TD Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks very much. Um, first on the Q4 outlook for the U.S., Patrice, sorry, I, I think I heard you right, but revenue down low single digits uh, and a very slight decline in, in EBITDA, is that what you said for Breeze Line? Yeah, exactly. Low, low single digit uh, decline in revenue. Oh, sorry, that's the full year. So for Q4, so yeah, it's the same thing. So low single digit uh, uh, growth in uh, revenue at Breeze Line, if that's your question, and, um, and uh, higher growth than this in uh, EBITDA in Q4 in the U.S. Oh, okay. So I mixed, I mixed up the full year. So for, for the quarter, you expect both of those to be up year over year. Exactly. And that is driven, I mean, we see what the subscribers are, so obviously it can't be driven by that. It, it's driven by a rate increase. Can you give us any sense of how big the rate increase was in June? Yeah, it, it was not a large one, but it was across the base. Uh, so, um, so I would say it was uh, uh, smaller than what we normally do. Uh, but there's also other elements. <clears throat> we, did, uh, we did proceed with some uh, reductions in uh, FTEs at the uh, uh, early part of the quarter, uh, so there's uh, some benefits there. Um, you know, there's more cord cutting on video as well in the U.S. across the board uh, in the industry, so uh, so that um, that reduces some revenue, but it also uh, offsets some costs on uh, video. And we have other elements as well uh, in terms of cost reductions that are in motion. Um, so I would say it's a, it's a mix of these uh, four elements. That, that makes sense. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Vince, if I may compliment that. Uh, Patrice indicated uh, the price increase, uh, but uh, specific to OIO, let's remember that we have not uh, increased the price since we've acquired these assets, so it actually gave us a good position to, uh, to better compete. Uh, but this price increase is across the whole base, including OIO, so we feel we're good with a price increase, including OIO this time. Okay, um, thank you for that. Just, Patrice, the, the explanation on EBITDA with the cost reductions makes a lot of sense to me. I'm still struggling a bit with the math on how revenue turns positive when the trend line has been getting worse and the sub-ads got worse again in, in Q3. So if it's only a, Two percent or something rate increase. I don't see how that's going to change its trajectory. So, am I missing something else on the year-over-year -year comparison? Uh, yeah, there's 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 a bit of a, so this price increase. There's a, the product mix as well changes uh, uh, in the quarters, um, and also obviously the reason why the revenues are down this quarter in Q3 uh, primarily uh, or entirely are due to the sub losses in Ohio, but as you uh, remember, obviously, uh, when we made the switch over to our brand, uh, this is where we had more losses, and these losses have come down over time. So as time uh, passes, the negative impact of those initial larger losses is uh, is reducing. Okay, good enough on that. And uh, uh, a follow-up on wireless for me as well. Um, well, two, two quick ones. One, you mentioned the final rules that we saw from the CRTC in May, uh, unless I've missed something, I mean, they're still saying a seven-year sunset clause to, to need to build your own network. Is there any chance that there's some other revision coming at some point from either ICID or the CRTC to potentially extend that seven years, or is that something you don't think could come for until we're two or three years into the process? Yeah, well, from a CRTC point of view, I think we need to uh, give a chance to the framework to, uh, to, to, to get going first. I am not expecting them to uh, immediately <laughs> review that term, uh, but uh, let's, rem let's remember that the, there is, this is one way to expand the, um, uh, the timeline. There are other ways in signing long-term commercial MVNO agreements with uh, larger MNO, for example, or entering into network sharing agreements. 
uh, with others. So the extension of the seven-year, although in my opinion likely in, in the future, uh, is just one of three options and maybe even more. Fair enough. And last one, the $60 million, if I saw that correctly in the MDNA, that you spent on Spectrum in, in Q3, it surprised me a little bit how much that was. It wasn't this Spectrum for more smaller markets where you didn't have Spectrum before, or, or did I miss something? You actually bought Spectrum in a major city like Toronto or Montreal that, that would cost more. No, no, it was uh, actually the former. So we've ex we've expanded from 91% to 95% coverage of our of our operating footprint with that. Yeah, so they so this, th those were in Quebec. So in the last auction, we bought mainly in Ontario. Um, the pricing there there were there were many areas uh, for auction in Quebec, but uh, we ended up buying very little in Quebec. And we had an opportunity here to buy on a private basis some spectrum in Quebec in cities where we either had nothing or we had very little spectrum. So it helped us basically beef up the spectrum uh, packages in the areas. And when you look at it on a, on a per um, uh, uh, megahertz spot basis, it's quite lower than the pricing we've seen in the last auction, what we were able to secure now. So, so we felt comfortable with it. Do you have that figure, Patrice? Was it sub a dollar per megahertz per pop? It was, uh, yeah, it was uh, just above a, a dollar, so about a, a dollar ten. Thank you. Thank you. Next question will be from Jérôme Dubreuil at Desjardins. Please go ahead. Bonjour tout le monde. Thanks for for taking my uh, my questions. Uh, going back to the U.S. Uh, you know, despite the economics of cost per, per gigabyte on fixed wireless, uh, you know, we've seen these large fixed wireless players now committing resources uh, to expanding fixed wireless capacity. You know, some have been calling it the, the only killer app of 5G right now, and they've put a lot of money in 5G, so maybe an incentive for them to keep going on that front. Does that make accelerated investments in the U.S.? more attractive since you need growth or less attractive to do? Could you specify um, when you say uh, other investments, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, previously maybe we were expecting the large fixed wireless players to run into capacity issues and now uh, now it doesn't it doesn't seem to be to be as much uh, as much of a problem from, from recent communication from, from Verizon uh, Notable. So they are very targeted in their approach to the market and fixed wireless access. So there's a uh, there's a specific amount of capacity that they have uh, that they have on every sector of these uh, cell sites, and uh, that's what they allocate to 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 fix wireless. The, the the overall question of spectrum is still limited. So they might be adding a little bit more spectrum to expand. A uh, number of customers per cell sector, uh, but still they they will be limited by um, by the spectrum usage, and we assume that they will want to monetize furthermore the spectrum, turning turning it to the next 5G applications. Uh, but it it might uh, last a little bit longer than uh, than we anticipated in the market, and they are opening small but other other areas of coverage here and there, but uh, in a very targeted manner. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe just one clarification, and maybe you, you've already mentioned it, but just want to confirm that you are fully eligible to the MVNO regime with all the CRTC requirements of home network and, and all the other requirements we've seen. Yes, we, um, we have... Uh, a public mobile network in situ. It's actively offering mobile service to retail customers, and this is um, this is why we've started negotiation as we are compliant with the definition. Great, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Next question will be from Stephanie Price at CIBC. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. 
I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the timeline um, for bead funding to roll out to the telecom providers in the U.S. And, and give us a bit of a ballpark on how big an opportunity this could be for Cogeco in the U.S. Sure. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, so the, the allocation by state was just done by the federal government. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. Mm -hmm. um, so then there is a process uh, that the states have to follow with uh, uh, time limitations. They can go as fast as they want, but there's time limitations on it. And it's a two-phase two uh, process where initially 20% of the funds get released. And when the second phase happens, and it's uh, basically defining the maps and exactly the houses, uh, then the 80% gets released. So it will probably vary a lot by uh, state. And uh, what we're expecting is that some of these uh, bidding uh, on, in some states is going to start in early 24. Uh, that's calendar 24. And uh, some will uh, stretch into 25. And it's possible that uh, for the last pieces will be in 26. So it will be, uh, it will be spread out. What we're doing on our side is uh, getting ready. Uh, so we have a, obviously a team on it. And we're operating in many states, as you know. So. Um, there's a lot of work uh, being done behind the scenes looking at the different maps so, so that uh, we're ready to respond when the states launch their own processes. Great. Thank you. And, and just on capital allocation, it looks like you paused on buybacks in the quarter, um, likely just given Axio and, and the spectrum you acquired. How should we think about capital allocation uh, at this point? Sure. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, just before I forget what the dates I gave you on the bid program, this would be to bid. Um, once you win an area, then there's a time period to uh, do the design of the network, get the permits, and start the construction. So the CapEx element would be further out. Uh, in terms of capital allocation, um, obviously we, uh, we are um, focusing on generating enough free cash flow to do uh, these acquisitions and buybacks pay the dividend and raise the dividend and invest in these um, in, in these uh, bid programs and the ones we're doing in Canada right now. Unfortunately, we're able to do a bit of all this. Uh, the buybacks, uh, we do it more on an uh, opportunistic basis, uh, depending on uh, obviously how we see the value. And obviously, we, we see value in the stock, that's for sure. Uh, but also we have to look at the leverage and the other opportunities uh, that are there. Um, as you know, with the, uh, our plans in Canada, uh, we have been accumulating a spectrum and that, that we had an opportunity to do some more uh, right now. So that was, a, 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 we think, a good uh, uh, investment for us. And you have to grab these opportunities when they come as the buyback can be uh, increased or decreased as we see fit uh, for now or in the future. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your touchtone phone. And your next question will be from Matthew Griffith at Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about um, you know, how you feel about the, your pricing power uh, in the U.S. market. Um, you obviously are going through a, a price increase, so that's kind of a positive indication, but you also referenced uh, higher levels of competition than before, and the, you know, it's not really the, indir the direct impact of fixed wireless access, the, the indirect impact that they're having on competitor pricing. So if you could just talk about, you know, how you see that um, playing out, and if this, if we should expect a uh, kind of subscriber impact from this price increase um, going into Q4. Yes, um, and of course we've mentioned the macroeconomic factors, the uh, high inflation that is going on, uh, but our products are actually um, well in demand. Broadband is a uh, almost critical uh, or essential service. So, uh, and, and we've mentioned a number of times already the uh, improve in the product mix. So customers are actually moving up uh, using uh, broadband more and more. There is um, a, a good pricing power for the industry. Uh, that's why we, we can actually 
offset the uh, the CPI with some pre press, uh, price increase. Um, the back to the pressures, they're localized from fixed wireless access. Uh, it's not um, throughout the country. It's very localized. So of course we have to to have uh, marketing strategies that can address uh, the localization of uh, of some promotions. But but in general, um, I think while under pressure, uh, there it's still a good market as a, it's a. Uh, the product is in, in, in good demand. Everybody needs it. Okay, good. That's helpful. And then uh, I think in uh, Ohio, you referenced that there's uh, still more work to do. And I think you used kind of similar terminology um, last quarter. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what work it is that you're doing and, um, and maybe – if, if, when, if you have some visibility onto um, you, when that work will be complete? Well, um, uh, I, I've specifically also mentioned the, uh, our brand presence and awareness in this market uh, requiring a little bit more time. So we continue to, uh, to raise the awareness of our Breeze Line brand. Remember when we acquired those assets, uh, they carry the, a different brand name, so that's one of uh, the major elements to be known in the market so we can sell well in that market. We also invest uh, in, um, as we in generally do everywhere, but more so in uh, Ohio, to raise uh, the quality um, of the product and services that we sell to be the best, simply the best in the market so we can attract more customers. Um, and it's, so it's a, big, uh, it's a mix of building the best product uh, portfolio, uh, the best customer service in that market, making the brand more, um, more relevant to, uh, to, to all customers, um, and activating all the sales channels from uh, door to door to, uh, to, uh, to, to to, to internet or the um, uh, agents that we have uh, talking to customers daily. Yeah, if I can add also um, what's a bit new this quarter, actually, we have, uh, we're not done with the service agreement we had with the seller. Uh, so now we fully control uh, basically the network and that has its uh, advantages uh, for sure. And we're continuing to, uh, to add the capacity to it. So we're upgrading, uh, continuing to upgrade the network. Uh, so that helps with stability and, and upselling customers as well. And lastly, uh, we're rolling out IPTV. Not, not a, a large portion takes IPTV, uh, but, uh, but, but there's a portion of the customers. And uh, that's a much uh, more modern uh, service uh, than, uh, than what's been provided before. Okay, good. Thank you. And if I could ask just one more, just touching on the the, the wireless question, I, I think Patrice, you uh, oh no, sorry, it was uh, Philip that mentioned that it, you know introducing a wireless uh, service is is critical to your business case. I, I believe you said. Sorry if I, I misquoted a little there, but it, the criticality was an element. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. You know what? Um, if you could point to what it is that you're hoping to um, achieve, perhaps in a broad strokes, uh, from uh, offering the wireless service? Okay, so let's, come, let's go back to, uh, we've always said and still believe that uh, we have a very strong broadband business and that business can continue to organically grow on its own and we are expanding its footprint. So there's a, a very solid, good business there. We would like to add a mobile product in our portfolio to expand our share in the uh, telecom spending um, in the marketplace, but it's an, in a, it's an additional uh, growth through the additional of a product. Now, what I said was that the rate negotiations with the MNO are critical to the success of the, uh, the mobile business case for the long term, so that's why we're we're negotiating right now, and uh, we 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 will um, look forward to having a set of rates to support to sustain the long-term viability of this product of this business case. Um, but back to broadband, we've always said that uh, we have a good 
business and we can continue to grow it on its own. Okay, thank you for the clarification. I, I didn't misquote you there a little bit, so thanks for that. Operator, any other questions uh, in line? At this time, sir, we have no further questions. Please proceed with closing. Okay. Well, thanks uh, to all for joining us today, and we'll, uh, we'll be available for your questions until uh, we meet for the next call, uh, the next uh, fourth quarter call. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this does indeed conclude your conference call for today. Once again, thank you for attending, and at this time, we do ask that you please disconnect your lines. Have a good weekend.